Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to the Prairie at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. And our latest edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this episode of Iowa Outdoors. We'll traverse newly reclaimed wetlands across the state. Row out into the Mississippi River pools for a unique fishing opportunity. Record the natural sounds of Iowa's Great Lakes region. And explore another trail in a minute. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. It's easy to take for granted everything the outdoors provides. Today, we'll go fishing on one of the man-made fishing havens on the Mississippi River, as well as record our environment in a manner you might not normally consider. But first, I hope you brought your waders because we're headed to the wetlands. Over the last 150 years, the majority of Iowa's native wetlands have been destroyed. In fact, less than 10% of our state's original marshes, fens, and bogs still exist. And while that loss is great, those wetlands aren't necessarily gone forever. There's an entire network of farmers, conservationists, homeowners, and developers working together to restore the lost benefits of Iowa's wetlands. We got a lot of rain last night, so I don't know how wet and muddy it's gonna be, but we'll find out. This is a private developer's project. So their idea was they purchased this piece of land and came up with a, a design for residential development where they could build houses on the higher areas. But this particular property included quite a large piece that is down in the, the, the floodplain of the Raccoon River. And they really couldn't do a lot with it. So their original intent was just to make an open space and uh, a, a, an asset for the, uh, the homeowners association. And we're going to make some modifications to the, to the site just to make it a little bit wetter. We're going to put some cross berms in here just to slow the water down as it comes through the site. Uh, and then we're going to plant it to, uh, to, to native wetland species. So. Kevin Griggs is in the wetland restoration business. More appropriately, his nonprofit business, the Iowa Ag Mitigation Bank, works to restore wetlands, take the flood mitigation credits from a site, and sell them to farmers who wish to develop on floodplain land. The way the Iowa Ag Mitigation Bank works is we work with farmers that have a need for replacing wetlands on their own property. So let's say that they want to uh, replace a one acre farmed wetland on their property uh, with a wetland someplace else. They have the ability to do that themselves on their own property, but a lot of people don't have the, the, the time, the experience, um, or the property available to do that. So the Iowa Ag Mitigation Bank provides another solution. They're able to purchase a credit for that wetland at a project that we have already developed. In this case, uh, this particular one's gonna be about 27 acres. This will provide the opportunity to provide 27 acres of mitigation for farmers that need to mitigate that, that land themselves. In the flood mitigation world, this West Des Moines site is a perfect example of how an urban development can benefit a rural partner. The urban property owner retains the land use rights, while at the same time, a rural farmer benefits from those floodplain reduction efforts. We wouldn't normally think of a development project within the city of West Des Moines to provide suitable mitigation for uh, farmed wetlands in north central Iowa, but this one just, it just works. All the right features came together, the right interest was there, the right players, and, uh, and we're just going to make it work. Until the late 1970s, some government programs actually encouraged the conversion of wetlands for farming and development. This indifference led to over 90% of Iowa's wetlands being destroyed, which means the Iowa we see before us today is nothing like it once was. 
So there were stories of people being able to canoe across central Iowa because of the, the potholes that were out there. So we've effectively drained a lot of those. Our rivers, we've channelized and straightened our rivers. We've rained them in so that their floodplains aren't as big and they're more in size than they used to be. So we would have had rivers that waved back and forth and had a nice floodplain where it could have come out and flooded in the vegetation and gone back in without doing any damage. So we've altered that a lot in Iowa, but that's what it would have looked like. Mitigating flood risk is something all Iowans are on board with. However, filling in wetlands removes a long list of benefits that comes with them. So wetlands, they are an amazing ecosystem of wildlife and flowers and grasses. And then there's the whole water quality benefit of wetlands. Their water sits in them and slowly goes back into the ground, back into our aquifers, recharges our groundwater that a lot of folks get their drinking water from. So they help settle out all the contaminants and nutrients that you don't want to drink. So it makes it more um, cost effective for the water treatment plants to treat those waters. And restoring wetlands has the potential to bring back all of those benefits. In Sac City, Kirby Roberts was so enamored with the conservation aspects, as well as the hunting potential for restoring his wetland property, that over the course of several years, he actually established the largest privately owned wetland in the state. I bought my first piece of ground in uh, 1992. The big pond was here, but it was farmed all the way around it up to the water. I could see the potential over here because there was water standing in the fields, cornfields. So I bought it, and with that, I continued to buy. And I bought a total of eight times to, to uh, accomplish my 220 acres. Kirby has done a, a fantastic job at restoring wetlands on his property. He's very, very passionate about that. He's taken it upon himself to enter into uh, several federal programs, the Wetlands Reserve Program and a couple of other ones, to pr provide some financial assistance to help him restore those. We were actually able to come in after he had finished all that construction, purchase the permanent easement from him and provide that permanent protection for that site. In this case, permanent means permanent. Wetlands that are restored through the National Resource Conservation Service can never be farmed or developed again. That may sound like a negative for farmers, but the process does generate revenue for otherwise unproductive land, and the entire restoration is taken care of. We pay 85% of the market value of the property, which can be considerable. In Iowa, we have such great soils, our land values are fairly high, so we'll pay for that. And then we also pay 100% of the restoration costs, so we'll come in and do the seeding and do the dirt work and pay for all that for you. In all, the wetland restoration process is a win. While it took generations of native habitat loss to get to this point, these modern conservation actions are helping bring modern life into harmony with our natural environment. It's certainly conservation minded in that the purpose of the Ag Mitigation Bank is to replace those low quality uh, uh, farmed wetlands with a higher quality wetland that's permanently protected. This property is a good, good example of that. It was a floodplain wetland before any development ever came to West Des Moines. It was cleared and drained for, for agriculture originally. This was the outskirts of the, of, of the metro area. So in this case, we're able to do that. This is, this is former farm ground. Now it's gonna have a permanent protection on it. It's gonna be uh, wetter than it was before. And it provides aesthetics. To build houses around this, uh, this large wetland complex is gonna be fantastic for those landowners. They'll be able to watch the wildlife and enjoy the scenery out their back windows. Unlike our neighbors to the north, fishing in Iowa is primarily about rivers and streams. And while our state may not be home to 10,000 lakes, we are bordered by one of the longest, most powerful rivers in the world. The mighty Mississippi River is a major thoroughfare for commerce, agriculture, tourism, and wildlife. While thousands of tourists flock to take in the annual migration, the depths of the Mississippi River inspire just as much wonder to avid fishermen. Fishing the Mississippi is something else. For starters, when you consider the water levels, the powerful current, and the temperature variance, when it comes to angling, there is no habitat like this river anywhere in the Midwest. We got 100 species of fish in the Mississippi, and it's one of the challenges of managing the thing. You know, the, this is a fishery that's, that's out here. It's in the channel, it's in the current. You know, it's, you know, we have a whole nother fishery that's in these backwaters that are Slackwater fish, your crappies, your bluegills, and so that's a whole different fishery. Scott Gritters has spent the better part of 30 years working on the Mississippi, and in Bellevue, he's the perfect guide for learning about the river as well as the waters that form it. 
Now in Mill Creek here, it's crystal clear. This is actually a trout stream on the upper end. It breaks off into little and big mill trout stream. Thousands of creeks, rivers, and streams flow into the Mississippi. And the health of the river is informed by these tributaries. Mississippi River Pool 13 is loved so deeply by fishermen because streams like Mill Creek just south of the Lock and Dam are looked after. Still, the interconnected nature of the main channel and all of Iowa should not be taken lightly. We're at the end of every raindrop that it spits in Iowa comes through here. You know, so if we can keep that, that water clean the whole way through, wherever it lands to whatever stream it gets into, um, whatever river it moves into next, and then ends up in the Mississippi, you know, the better off we are all the way through the system for all the all interior fish and, and for the fish that are in the Mississippi. Of course, there is another rather large element in Bellevue that pretty much defines the fishing. Lock and Dam 12 has been in place for nearly 100 years, and it's not going anywhere. Luckily, it was built with the underwater inhabitants in mind. Yeah, the dam's here, and it's always going to be here, and we're going to—we're just going to have to live with the lock and dam system. One, one thing about the Mississippi lock and dams versus other dams is that the fish can migrate through it. This opposed to a, you know, a big earthen structure like the Sailor Bills, the you know, Coralvilles, the Red Rocks. You know, this doesn't always block their the fish migration, um, which is a good thing. This river is still a river. You can tell we're in floating current. This is not slack water, you know. This is still the Mississippi River. It's not the Mississippi Lake. While Scott is focused on addressing issues of the Pool 13 ecosystem, fishermen can simply enjoy it. You know, I tell everybody it's as close to heaven as I'm going to get without going through the pearly gates, living in eastern Jackson County. You know? <laughs> oh, I love it here. You know, how fortunate are we to have fishing hunting outdoors? Junior Miller is a staple of the Eastern Iowa fishing community. Having fished the lock and dam pools for over 30 years, Junior knows every secret there is to angling on the mighty Mississippi. Well, fishing this tailwater here, you got some, uh, you got some current going on here. And uh, this time of the year, these wallies and saugers really relate to this tailwater because it's the bait fisher here, you know. But that's, that's the thing here, you got current going on. Uh, Sometimes it's a lot of current. When you get high water, it really gets wild out here. You know, only the good Lord knows what's gonna happen on the water level, you know. Spring and summer may be more popular fishing months due to warmer temperatures and noticeably active fish. But Junior says the fall is prime time to drift out onto the river and cast a line. The fish are here, and I mean, they will catch fish. And they're getting into their, I call it their spawn mode. I compare them to like uh, salmon or something. Oh, yeah. you know, they keep working their way upstream. A lot of these river fish act, they yeah. migrate. Just, yeah. Even bluegills go to those overwintering spots, you know, every year they go to yeah. certain areas, you know. Right. Water Come this time of year, the sauger move up to the tailwater. One benefit of the Mississippi is the fish population is self-perpetuating. Unlike inland waterways that depend on stocking, the massive nature of the Mississippi allow for large populations to sustain themselves. Of course, that also depends on fishermen and women following take-home regulations. So this is a little sauger, okay? So With the sauger fish, the limits are pretty loose. Saddles. There's no size limits to a sauger, so you could keep a fish this size if you wanted, okay? But walleye in this section of the Mississippi River, you can keep them from 15 to 20 inches is when you can keep them. You can also keep one over 27 inches, just one. Beyond size, the bag and possession limit is the most important number to remember. A single fisherman can take home a total of six fish daily, with only 12 walleye and sauger combined allowed in your freezer at one time. So if an abundance of fish and a beautiful, unique surrounding sounds interesting to you, the Mississippi lock and dam pools are waiting. If you talk to any of us DNR people, you know, one of the things is we want to keep the Mississippi looking like a great wildlife refuge, you know? We want to leave that legacy um, that it is a place to go. It is, it is different than the place that you come from. Throughout the run of our program, we featured dozens of artists who are masters at capturing the perfect outdoor photo. 
but it's time we admit we've been severely neglecting an important part of every outdoor experience, the sound. What does Ledges State Park sound like? Or how about the Les Hills? Believe it or not, acoustic ecology is an art form interested in studying and preserving these sounds so that we can remember them for generations to come. So a couple of times uh, during the two-week class, we get up incredibly early in the morning so that we can get out and record what's known as the dawn chorus. The dawn chorus is this time in nature where the wildlife and their vocalizations becomes incredibly rich. And so it starts a little bit before first light and it continues through sunrise. You know, in order to capture this really dynamic time in the soundscape, we need to get out there and get our microphones running. That lets us capture this transition of nighttime to daytime, and that's when this dawn chorus uh, is the most rich. Welcome to a common morning for the acoustic ecology students at Iowa Lakeside Lab in Dixon County. Fueled by plenty of caffeine, an ample supply of AA batteries, and led by Iowa State University interactive design professor Alex Braidwood. You know, again, this was written <laughs> quite a while ago, so I don't really appreciate the word poor, but it says poor towns are quieter than prosperous towns. Yeah, right. This is a class unlike any in Iowa. So acoustic ecology really looks at the idea of the soundscape and what the soundscape can communicate. And so it's about studying this space, this idea of what is sound, what is the role that sound plays, and what are the things that we can do in order to maintain a healthy environment. And sound not only is an indicator of that, the wellness of an environment, but also if you're able to protect certain elements of the soundscape, you're going to kind of end up saving some other things along the way. Where you're at, you'll get that transition from insects yes, to birds. Yes, I think so. I think, or just like a lot of insect, it's, it's up for debate at yeah. this point. Back in the van, the classroom portion of the course begins. The, the chapter about the, the biophonic orchestra, because it's where he starts laying out his like niche theory. Yes. And that's this, that's this kind of translation, that's this like spectral division that you're talking about, where like insects have operated more kind of in these like higher pitch regions. The, um, you know, the birds are sort of in the middle range, which is, you know, about the same place that human voice exists. And then there's other things that are down in sort of the low frequencies in the, in the infrasonic range. Mm -hmm. So once the recorders are running, we all come back to the van. We close the van up as quietly as we can. We make sure that we're outside of the recordings. And then we use that time, that hour and a half or so, as basically like a seminar portion of the class where I've assigned some readings, students come with questions, and we use it as like a reading group. We talk about the theory, we talk about our own experiences, we talk about some of the other information that um, has come about from like maybe the videos that we've watched or the, or the book chapters that we're reading. And I bring coffee, so I know it's early, but uh, it tends to be this like really engaged time where chatting about sound and sound studies, it, it tends to be a pretty dynamic conversation. As the sun starts to peak over the horizon, the conversation starts to dissipate, and soon enough it's time to get out of the van, gather the field recorders, and see what sounds they've captured. It's usually excitement, um, you know, especially these like dawn choruses where they've left the recorders out there running and don't know exactly what it's capturing. And so then what we do, you know, we come back, we have breakfast, and then we go back into the lab and start analyzing and looking through what was recorded. And so as they're listening, you know, they will find things that they didn't know that was there. They got a, uh, maybe they got a goldfinch that vocalized like really close to the microphone, or maybe like this morning, some deer ran through the water. And so it's a, it's a real sort of exciting thing to not know what's gonna be there and then be able to listen through and, and hear you know, what, you, what you did in fact collect. The acoustic ecology class is only one of the courses held at the Iowa Lakeside Lab right on the waters of West Okoboji Lake. Focused primarily on biological research, the Board of Regions funded laboratory also hosts an artist in residence program of which Alex is the director. The majority of the activity that happens here is related to the sciences, biology, field study courses, ecology, you know, um, aquatic ecology, lake studies, things like this. But then alongside of all of that and integrated with all of that is an artist in residence program 
where I have the ability to bring uh, anywhere from like three to six artists per season from around the country here to make their work. And the, the focus of the residence program is people who are working at the intersection of art, science, and nature. When an artist isn't creating, they're urged to join the courses being held at the lab. For Kristen Carr, a photographer participating in the artist in residence program, taking part in the dawn chorus outing was too tempting to pass up. So getting up at four was, uh, I was a little hesitant at first, but the walk from my room over to the, the, uh, the van was amazing. And so experiencing the campus at 4 a.m. is incredible because you can see the stars, it's really dark and it's really quiet. Having the experience at 4 a.m. or having the, the recordings of sound at that time of day um, is basically opening up my world to a lot of new things. So that's been a lot of fun. Those new experiences don't end with the dawn course. Following breakfast, Alex and crew loaded up special hydrophones designed to record sounds from objects or materials that come in contact with it. As the name might suggest, it's best used in underwater sound recordings. We can translate uh, ideas of like underwater noise to impacting, you know, uh, whale calls and migratory patterns and things like that. But it's also valuable to just think about in a lake like this, what is the impact of all the recreational vehicles? And of course, it's like incredibly fun to be on the lake and, and that's, a, that's a good portion of what it does, but it's worth thinking about what is happening underneath the water um, acoustically. And so we took kayaks out because we like to try to be, you know, we like the, the idea of the silent sports. So we, we took kayaks out, we put hydrophones in the water and, and gave everybody a chance to listen and record for a while of what's happening underneath there. And you can hear some activity. We're at the point in the season where some docks are going in. So you can hear the mechanical sounds of the docks being put in. There's some fishing boats came by, some power boats came by. And so you get to hear the, the sounds that those things are making uh, underwater. Of course, hydrophones are specific and expensive recording equipment. But heading out into the backyard and trying your own hand at acoustic ecology doesn't truly require top of the line gear. In fact, Alex says gear should be the last thing you consider. You start by going outside. You can use the voice memo app on your phone. It doesn't matter. Like if you want to go outside and record sound, just go outside and record sound. Tag it, put it on the internet, share it with people, play it back to yourself when you're trying to fall asleep. As you get into it, like recording equipment doesn't have to be expensive. There are some really great like intro level things that you can do for like less than people pay for cable television a month. And so Getting out and just doing it is absolutely where it starts. It's time for IPTV's Trail in a Minute, where we give you a first-person view of a different Iowa hiking, biking, or water trail each episode. It's an opportunity to relive a previous experience or plan a future adventure. And it's a pretty cool way to view the Iowa outdoors. Take a look. On the banks of the Cedar River, the Cedar Cliff Trail inside Palisades Kepler State Park is a wonderful mix of challenge and beauty. Starting with an upper and lower segment, we suggest taking the right fork as the upper track gives you a better idea of what's ahead. Climbs, switchbacks, and excellent views. While a round trip is only two miles, everyone will need a break from all the up and down. Thankfully, there are plenty of benches and overlooks to stop and appreciate the surroundings. The stone wall and gazebo offer a perfect spot to post a selfie and make your friends jealous of your adventure. But once you've found your bearings, the trek continues with a more challenging part of the path. As the narrow stone staircases begin, be sure of your footing. The stones can be slick, even on dry days. Plus, the trail shrinks and expands randomly from four feet to two feet. You'll know you've reached the turnaround point after a steep descent down a dirt path. 
If you're looking to trek on, there are many paths to choose. If not, take a breather by the river before hitting the trail back home. That wraps up this episode of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy Iowa's parks and recreational opportunities. If you're planning any outdoors travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. While our episodes will continue to bring you outdoor adventures over the Iowa airways, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for extended features and extra content. And feel free to tag Iowa Outdoors in your online posts. Who knows, you might make it onto the show. For now, we'll leave you with more images of Iowa's outdoor environments. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.